Today we've got Craig Pinkney in the hot seat because he's an individual that's been doing great work in the community and nationally and even internationally. But there are those people who like to spread, you know, unwanted rumors. So the aim is to dispel those myths, dispel those rumors, get the clarity of what it is he's doing so that we all can focus on the great work that needs to be done rather than the negative. You've jumped into the hot seat, so it's my opportunity to ask you those questions that may be a bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's to clear up things from the community's perspective. There are some people that say, why is Craig doing the work he's doing when he hasn't did road, okay? He wasn't a road man or a gang member. What do you say to that? Why do I have to be a gang member to do this work? From a young child, I lived in a community where I seen and experienced violence. Um, I have a family that started one of the first youth centres in the Midlands, um, the Nightingale project, pr project. My grandma, Mavis Pinkney, that opened the door for hundreds of people that are doing brilliant work around the world. So from a child, I've always been social justice, working with the community has kind of been embedded into my DNA. So growing up around some of the individuals that we know of, um, for example, from a, a news perspective that have now served in 35 years, we watched those individuals grow, went to school with a lot of those people. So when people say do road, I, I don't get what people mean. Does that mean that because I haven't robbed anyone, because I haven't attacked someone, because I haven't shot no one, because I haven't gone to prison means that I can't contribute to my community and give a benefit. That doesn't make any sense because when I was a child, you had youth and community workers that wasn't from the road mm -hmm. and they gave us education, they gave us somewhere to stay, mm -hmm. they gave us something to do to deter us away from the things that we talk about in society. Yeah. So I actually believe that anybody that is from those experiences that don't actually take part, for me, you're supposed to do something in your community and give back to your community. <laughs> so for me, it's kind of a no-brainer, I think, going... Um, making that argument and saying you haven't done road in order for you to do that, I think is a silly, silly perspective. But I understand that people have that perspective. But regardless of that, anywhere I go within the West Midlands, people know that I was someone that lived in the community, yeah. someone that lived two, threes or doors away from one and two individuals that might be known for potentially the wrong things. And I've always known, as me as an individual, that I've never once said I was a gang member, never once said I was a thug, never once said I was a criminal. Mm -hmm maybe done some criminal activities when I was a child, young teenage, doing very silly things, but never claimed to be a part of anything. And I think that's the reason why I have also been so effective in the communities that I work in, because then I'm not tied to one particular group. No group can say that I am the spokesperson for that group, or I'm the spokesperson for that particular group. Yes, I might concentrate on one particular area, because that's the area where I grew up, B18, yeah. Hockley, Winston Green is where I grew up. So naturally, all of the information that I've been given, learned, developed for myself, I bring that back to the same community and then I work outwardly. Brilliant. So would you say you're someone who works in the community? Definitely, all, all the time. Um, I think it's, you know, it's something that for me, I immerse myself in that community and I think, you know, people kind of look at some of the stuff that I'm doing now and think, oh, these individuals are just in universities. And again, parents call me all the time. I'm in people's households every time. But I don't think that that is something that you need to promote because you're dealing with trauma. You're dealing with, you know, people that are upset. You're dealing with territorial families. And sometimes that's not required to be promoting that and talking about that 24-7. So what about... You went to Jamaica recently. Um, congratulations. You was invited to go to Jamaica to work on the violence over there. Some people say, why, why are you? Why are you going to Jamaica? You're not from Jamaica. You don't regularly go to Jamaica and you're not doing the stuff here, but you're solving the problems over there. What do you say? Well, the quick fact is that I'm the diaspora of Jamaica. So my bloodline and my lineage traces back to that place. My family on both sides, mother and father, have houses there. So my family travel there very regular. So the Jamaican culture and the Jamaican experience is what I've been getting since the moment I came out of my mother's womb. So again, it's again a bit of a silly question that people would say that, but I understand it. Why me? I still don't know why me. What I do believe in when I asked um, the Ministry of Justice and the community workers that were over there, why me? They said that when they looked on social media, they were looking for professionals around the world that understand violence, understand how to connect with people, and were quite charismatic in how they did that. And my TED talk must have popped up when they was looking. 
And that's how they essentially found me. So when I was over there, they kind of said that, you know, it was interesting. I said there was kind of like, I was like a Umar Johnson slash um, kind of, uh, you know, Eric Dyson type of character in terms of my charisma and, and the way that I linked my community experiences to my practice. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why they essentially selected me. And I think to the other question that you said that, you know, why um, Jamaica? I think that, you know, Jamaica go through a series of problems very similar to the issues that are here, but more entrenched in somewhere like Jamaica. And I kind of felt that um, they obviously felt that I could contribute. So when I got there, what they actually originally asked me for changed. You know, so I know there was a lot of media coverage and it was kind of like Craig is there to save the day. I was, that yeah. was never my intention to save no day. But what it was was about understanding the context of the violence and how can I contribute. So one of the things that I, I learned when I was in Jamaica is one, their knowledge and competency about the issue was historical, dinosaur years. Mm -hmm. Number two, their responses were very reactive, similar to the stuff here. So I was able to draw some of the ideas that I've had here and kind of bring that over there. But one of the things that was interesting based on my research was looking at things like public health approaches, something that we haven't adopted here. So I looked at places like Chicago, Baltimore, New York that have been able to achieve reducing violence. And all I did was introduce them to that. But I would say I learned more from the Jamaicans than I did probably that I gave to them, but they say that they learned loads from me. So for me, it was a whole learning experience. My intention was never go there to save the day. There was no golden ticket that I came with and I didn't leave with any golden ticket. Like, yes, I finally managed to do it, but what my, my mission was, was to get them to understand the concept of violence and how they can implement things, but then the ball's on their court. So whatever happens in Jamaica now over the next 12 months, which I've had a series of meetings, whether or not that happens, that's on them. But I did my job in terms of helping them to do that because mm -hmm. they said that they had individuals in the past that didn't understand Jamaican culture, didn't understand them, um, didn't understand what was really going on in the country. But the moment I got there, they never once had to explain anything to me. They knew, clearly I understood what these people were talking about, whether mm -hmm. they were from country or from the city. No one, I didn't need a translator. And I was just immersed myself in the community. No different to what I do here. So even when on one of the days when a murder took place and everybody was running around and a bit scared, I wasn't shook mm. for the reason for we don't have the level of homicides here, but if you stand in certain areas yeah. <coughs> for too long, someone might slide around in the car and shoot. Mm -hmm. So we're used to those types of behaviours. Yeah. So again, that goes back to even your first question about do you have to be on road? <laughs> if you have to work on a road and you experience those things, I don't have to be a gang member mm -hmm. to be a victim of violence. I don't have to be a thug you know, to experience and watch individuals get hurt. And I've seen all of those types of things. So for me, it's kind of part and part with the stuff that I'm doing now. I just don't choose to promote everything online. And the things that I do choose to promote online is the reason why individuals from different countries are able to... Well, let me, let me go to the online, uh, because it, some say, well, you know, Craig's always posting stuff online. Uh, is he seeking self-praise? Uh, by keep posting the good work that he's doing. What do you say to I that? I it from the perspective of uh, motivation and inspiration. If I look at all of the greats, you know, that came before us, they post a lot. Um, they projected their ideas, their perspectives, and that's how we were able to know what it was that they do, and that's how we were able to become inspired. I go back to Malcolm X. If Alex Haley did not write that autobiography, I would not be inspired by Malcolm X. So I look at that from the first question and going in and living in a the community there where people actually believe that selling drugs and criminal activity is the only way that they're going to make it. <clears throat> so I do these things for a number of reasons. One, to show individuals that you can reach the highest level of someone that, can drop, that dropped out of school, someone that um, didn't do well in education, left with not really much GCSEs, was able to get to the level of PhD and not lose yourself, not lose your, who you are, not lose your, your swag, not lose your way you speak, not lose yeah. your identity because you're able to achieve that. And people say things like, yeah, but you, you go into a, a white man's institution and you know, you're learning all of these different things. And really it's a bit of, a, again, that's a silly problem or silly point that people make. Why? Because again, if you look at it from an academic perspective, since I'm an academic that people like to use those funny terms, um, you look at the people that defend, define these definitions and weren't they PhDs? Mm -hmm. And again, it's just, I think it's a, a, what, you're, what you're asking me is a, is a conversation that for me um, is a little bit hypocritical from the people that make those types of accusations. Mm -hmm. So with the stuff that I put online, you know, I, I need to be reachable you know, to members of the community. So I might upload something and it might be a parent that's online where the child's gone missing for a few days. Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't understand what's going on with my son. A lot of people that, are, that join the courses that I, that I deliver in the community join on the basis that they've seen a post. 
-hmm. They've seen me do something. So my third point is that we need to have a counter-narrative. With all the negative things that are projected online, there needs to be at least something where people can look at. Now, I'm not professing I'm the only one that does that. Yeah. There are many of us in the community, and I actually say people should have their own YouTube pages, Instagram pages, Twitter pages, and we need to just keep flooding a counter-narrative that has positive, that might have knowledge and information, that might talk about aspects of education, might talk about issues taking place, and might talk about solutions. But that's just me. Yeah. There needs to be someone in business that does that. There needs to be somebody in health that does that. There needs to be somebody that does, that's doing sport that does that. Um, someone that um, does stuff around trauma that needs to do that. So there's so many different categories. I'm just one category and I think what happens is when you're an individual that projects so much stuff online, people kind of look at you're the one that's supposed to answer every single question. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I always release videos and talk about there's not one solution to the problem. So I'm not saying that with the information, knowledge, and the things that I have to give to the community, my way is the only way, because there's probably 10 other ways to mm -hmm. deal with that, but I'm just in my lane and I'm comfortable in my lane. And I think that the problem that community have is they look at your lane and expect it to be everyone else's lane, yeah. and it's not me. Yeah. Uh, in relation to the posting material online as you mentioned the authorities in jamaica contacted you likewise the media will contact you as well mm. do you get paid for when you do a article with the newspaper no i think any paper that contacts you anyway unless i would assume it's a documentary i haven't been paid yet mm -hmm. so anybody that's watching this that wants to pay me for it if you like that or money <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the point yeah, i'm yeah. making is uh, what will happen is if something happens in the community or the, the wider society you'll have a loads of emails and a loads of courts. Why? Because again, they look on social media platforms, mm -hmm. they look on Google or whatever, they look at people's websites and they look at individuals that seem to know and understand certain things. So for example, I've done a series of <coughs> publications and again, YouTube videos that I've done. So when they contact me, they're like, oh, we've seen your YouTube video and he was talking about issues of trauma. However, the head of the Met Police said something else. Do you agree? And all I do is comment. However, they shape that comment is not, I think one of the things though, we need to be more skeptical about, and I'll say that is, what type of news reporters that we go to? Because yeah. we know that there's news reporters that take our information and then they might put up an image, they might put up a picture, um, they might put up a video, and that's unrelated to what they asked you, and then they pull it together, and then, then they put that out, and then the community look at that like, oh, you're an individual that, um, essentially it's working alongside with those individuals or entities and help them put those imagery. So we have to be more strategic and more smart about how we do that. Um, but then also we're not perfect. And I think sometimes people look at you as an individual that's doing stuff and expect you to get everything right. I done something on ITV about two years ago, I think it was a BBC, where they asked me for my comments around the rise of um, gun crime capital 2015-16. Um, I said, yeah, no problem, do it. And all I was talking about is the issues around young people, um, the issues around the cots and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, when they edited it for the six o'clock news, it was edited between two police officers. So it was like an officer spoke, I spoke, officer spoke, I spoke. So when it looked, it kind of looked like I was a police officer too. Because of my credibility, because of the work I do in the community, I got a call from prison and it was more of a joke, like, Craig, yo, what are you playing at? And I was like, when I got recorded, it was just me. That's the point that I'm making. Yeah. We need to ask more questions. And I think from, I can put my hand up and say, at that time, I was new to this media type of thing. And that's the reason why I'm comfortable in doing my own platform, because then I'm in control of everything. You can't be sometimes in control of what a media, a media person does, but that's learning that we can give. So from that, I've done YouTube videos and address things like that. So there are individuals in our community that go onto media platforms and they get a backlash. Why do they get a backlash? Because what they should know is that the individuals that write articles and the individuals that upload things online are oftentimes not friends of our community. Mm -hmm. And all they want to do is sensationalize and romanticize our trauma and our experiences. So when we go to those individuals, you can understand why the people in the community behave and critique the way that they do. But I would say from a learning perspective, that individuals that are coming into community and want to talk about these things, we need to have conversations more about those that have done it before. And that's why I rely on people like Dr. Martin Glynn, John Campbell, Raymond Douglas, and others that are doing this type of work so I can have a better understanding of how can I approach these things. And it's interesting that I had a really interesting conversation with my mentor, Dr. Martin Glynn, because he was like, I'm not gonna address the media. <clears throat> my perspective was, well, we critique all of the things that we see online, but where is the narrative that's grounded by experience based on um, intellectual 
um, responses. Yeah. And he was like, you know what? I didn't look at it like that. He was like, go forth and done it. And I've done a number of um, media articles. And thankfully, because I've specifically chose certain ones and chose to ignore certain ones, that's why I haven't been in those types of situations of late. Yeah. But it can happen. Uh, finally, you know, in terms of a piece of advice you would give, naturally, uh, with anything we do, there will always be someone who will have something negative to say. You've answered a number of questions which have floated around in the community uh, and, and, and they haven't asked you directly. And some people can get caught up in what's being said, not intentionally, but just following the gossip. So what's your advice to people who hear things, you know, and are, are going around and continuing the rumour spreading of negative um, perceptions? What, what's your advice? I look at it differently and I don't think I'm going to answer it in that way. I think people are... Some people are going to be negative regardless. Mm -hmm. No matter how much you do, it's not enough. If you don't do something, they're telling you to do something. You do something one way, they're telling you to do something completely different. I remember doing something the other day, um, a project, and someone critiqued it and said, oh, you should be doing stuff around health. You should be doing stuff around education and giving people the understanding of A, B, and C. But that's not my lane. You do it then. So for me, when I look at this stuff, it's... Sometimes, you know, without being disrespectful, it's sometimes amusing because the individuals that are often critiquing the most, that have something to do, when you look on their profiles, they have done nothing <laughs> and they don't do anything, but they've got loads to say. So you're talking to an individual that's not even a seasoned vet. I'm still new in this thing, 14 years in, and you're challenging me and telling me I need to do A, B, C, and D. I've always said my area is education, outreach work, training and development, Working with the, the young youths on the block, that's me. That's my bag. I don't do health. I don't, I'm not a specialist in trauma. I'm not a psychotherapist. I don't do stuff around sports. I can just about um, kick a football. There's so many other things that I don't do. So if you're so critical and want to do something so much, then please jump into those four categories, and I will support you and do that. And I think that's the problem. Everybody's looking at your lane, expecting your lane to go into everybody else's lane. So for me, to the critics, they're going to be critics regardless, mm -hmm. no matter what you do. And I think with all people of the past that we look up to and we stand on their shoulders, they all had critics. They all had people that were saying that they didn't do certain things. But the reality is, when a mother's crying, guess whose phone they phone? When a father's upset and his son's just been attacked or acid just got thrown in his face, whose phone do they call? When a, an organisation or a professional doesn't understand what's going on in relation to responding to their child, they call me. Not just me, but they call my phone. So if I can give back to those people in the best way that I can, then who are you to knock, knock me? Because I'm doing my bit. Problem is, is are you doing your bit? And what a lot of people do is they, they become keyboard warriors. They've got loads to say online. And in reality, oftentimes they don't do nothing. Job seekers allowance, all these types of things. And I'm like, at least the youths that I'm working with are actually trying to do something with their lives. But the critics... <laughs> I'll just leave it as that. This is the hot seat. You've answered the questions. Thank you very much. Keep doing what you're doing. And I continue to be inspired by your work. <laughs>